thank my colleagues from Rhode Island and Iowa for their cooperation in establishing the speaking order this evening. I'd like to speak for a moment about the vote that we just cast. We just confirmed Judge Wilkins to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. I voted against this judge, and in doing that, I joined my Republican colleagues for one simple reason. Several years ago, when President George W. Bush was in the White House, he nominated an eminently qualified lawyer named Peter Keisler, who had bipartisan support, who was not a partisan hack. He was a true craftsman in the law. He was someone that no one had any ideological opposition to, but he was blocked by the Senate Democrats at that time for the simple fact, based on the simple reason, that according to the Senate Democrats, the D.C. Circuit's caseload was not sufficiently robust to justify the filling of this position. Now, since that time, not very many things have changed. Since that time, if anything, the D.C. Circuit's caseload per judge has remained about the same, or some would argue has gone down a little bit, depending on which metric you use. One thing that has changed is that we have now a Democratic president in the White House instead of a Republican president in the White House. And suddenly my friends across the aisle have forgotten about the caseload-based arguments that they used a few years ago to keep Peter Keisler off of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. We've now confirmed, just in the last few weeks, three additional judges to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. This has happened against substantial Republican opposition that has been based on the very analysis that I've just outlined. And this has been facilitated by virtue of the fact that my distinguished colleague, the senior senator from Nevada, uh, joined by uh, his Democratic colleagues, chose a few weeks ago to exercise what's been referred to as the nuclear option. They broke the rules of the Senate in order to change the rules of the Senate. And they did so so that they can put m more people on the bench, so that they could put more people into top-level positions in this administration, uh, while more or less squelching the view of the minority party within the Senate. This is unfortunate. The most unfortunate aspect of it is the fact that it's part of a broader strategy that isn't limited to the D.C. Circuit. In fact, it's not even limited uh, uh, to the Senate's confirmation process uh, uh, with respect to these judges or other judges. It extends much more broadly than that. It's part of the same effort that convinced the President of the United States on January 4th, 2012, to make four appointments, three to the National Labor Relations Board and one to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, pursuant to the President's recess appointment power. Citing Article 2, Section 2, Clause 3 of the Constitution, the President claimed that he had the power to appoint these individuals without going through the Senate advice and consent process because, as he asserted, the Senate was in recess. There was only one problem with this. The Senate was not, in fact, in recess. Under Article 1, Section 5, Clause 2 of the Constitution, each chamber of Congress, including the Senate, has the right to determine its own rules, its own procedures. And according to the Senate's own rules and according to the Senate's own journal, the Senate was, in fact, in session as of January 4, 2012, the moment these supposedly recess appointments were made. This was a problem. Fortunately, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, prior, I would add, to the confirmation of the three recent judges that we've confirmed just in the last few weeks, concluded that this was a lawless act, that it was unconstitutional, that the president didn't have the right to deem the Senate in recess when, according to the Senate's own rules, the Senate was in session. The Senate was not in recess. That case today was reviewed by the Supreme Court of the United States, and I had the privilege of sitting in the courtroom just across the street and watching those proceedings. I was pleased to see that the checks and balances within our system were functioning, at least to the extent that we have our court system reviewing this act by the President of the United States. I think it's fortunate that we have this kind of judicial system that can review it. 
And based on what I saw today and the quality of the arguments presented to the court, I'm hopeful that the court will reach the same conclusion. I'm hopeful that the court, the Supreme Court, will affirm the judgment entered by the D.C. Circuit. In a broader sense, it's sad, it's disappointing that it even had to get that far. It's sad and it's disappointing that the President of the United States was willing to engage in such a lawless act as this. That the President of the United States was willing openly to flout the plain language, the text, the history, the tradition of the U.S. Constitution. Ours is not a government of one. It was with good reason that the Founding Fathers split up the power, including the power to appoint people to high federal office, such that the President could nominate, but the Senate got to confirm. The President's approach, pursuant to which the President of the United States could himself deem the Senate to be in recess if he didn't think the Senate was doing enough uh, when it went into brief sessions, the President himself could substantially circumvent the advice and consent rule that the Founding Fathers and the Constitution wisely placed in the hands of the Senate. So the reason I say that it's unfortunate that it had to get to that level, it's uh, unfortunate, first of all, that the President felt that it was okay, that it was acceptable to do this. He, of course, took an oath, not once but twice, to uphold, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. It's unfortunate, secondarily, that there was not more of an outcry from this body. Sure, there were a lot of Republicans who joined me in calling this action lawless, because it was. And it was sad that none of our colleagues from the other side of the aisle, at least not publicly, were willing to acknowledge the lawlessness of this act. Some acknowledged to me in private that it was problematic. Some acknowledged to me that there uh, uh, were some implications behind this that threatened the Senate as an institution. But I think we need to be more open, more faithful, more forceful, and less partisan about the way we defend the Constitution of the United States. Mr. President, to me this would not matter. If this were a Republican president, I would be arguing with equal strength on this issue. And in the future, when we have a Republican president, if any Republican president is lawless enough to try this, I will oppose it with everything in me. Mr. President, we ourselves take an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And I think that involves doing more than simply leaving it to the courts to iron out the details. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I yield the floor.